I want to be straight with you. There will be no return to the old normal for the foreseeable future. I repeat, there will be no return to the old normal for the foreseeable future. So people assume uh, we are just going back uh, to the good old world which we had um, and everything will be normal again in how we are used to normal in the old fashion. This is, uh, let's say, fiction. It will not happen. A vaccine on its own will not end the pandemic. I don't know how it will play out in uh, November, but what we know is that we will end up with many more unemployed and uh, particularly also people in the grey economy which are not counted for, uh, who lose their jobs. So we will see definitely a lot of anger um, already now, but probably increased by the end of the year uh, because this crisis will be with us until we really have found a remedy. From food shortages to energy shortages, to economies collapsing, ideals being broken, tradition being stomped on and forgotten, sides being pitted against each other, bickering over damn. foolishness, to endless conflict overseas and here at home. Where is all of this death, destruction, and hate coming from? Well, I think I might have an idea as to who and what just might be orchestrating us as if we were nothing more than puppets on a string. Look no farther than the self-proclaimed saviors of humanity in the world. I present to you the World Economic Forum. really get a handle on this situation, it's best to start with their history. They were founded back in January 24th of 1971 as a nonprofit based in Geneva, Switzerland, by a man named Klaus Schwab per the recommendation of Henry Kissinger, who was a former U.S. Secretary of State. They were originally known as the European Management Forum before the World Economic Forum. Its original reason for existing was so that the European management firms could catch up to the U.S. management firms. Klaus Schwab also developed and promoted the stakeholder management approach, which based corporate success on managers taking account of all interests, not merely shareholders, clients, and customers, but employees in the communities within which they operate, including government. After the collapse of the Bretton Woods fixed exchange rate mechanism and the Arab-Israeli war, Klaus wanted to expand his meetings, not just from financial, but also to social issues. After that, political leaders were invited for the first time to Davos in January of 1974. Davos is an annual meeting where almost all leaders from around the globe come together to decide how you and I should best live our lives, excluding the part where our voices or concerns are heard. Two years later, the organization introduced a system of membership for the 1,000 leading companies of the world. The European Management Forum was the first non-governmental institution to initiate a partnership with China's Economic Development Commissions. In 1987, the European Management Forum became the World Economic Forum and sought to broaden its vision to include providing a platform for dialogue. And in 2015, the forum was officially recognized as an international organization. It is now on the next phase of its journey as the global platform for public-private cooperation. In their own words, quote, they seek to create a new global economic reality known as the Great Reset by 2030. It's commonly misunderstood as, oh, this is just recycling, creative reuse, and creating food and energy resources for everyone, right? What it's actually about is moving populations into concentrated city centers and moving them out of the rural areas. The people then could be easily monitored and controlled, leaving the elite total dominion over the entire globe. If you don't believe me, just take a good look at the line being built in Saudi Arabia and Neom Tabuk, which is now currently under construction. 
It is supposed to be the future of urban living. It claims on their website to have no cars, roads, or emissions, and that it will run on 100% renewable energy. It is only 200 meters wide and 170 kilometers long. It is supposed to house 9 million people inside of its walls. I guess the only thing they left out of the website is the fact that once you go inside those walls, you're never gonna come out of them. They want to destroy representative government and move it into a government by unelected boards and commissions. The European Union has already accomplished this. They want to impose globalization incrementally through regionalization. They want to push principles of public-private partnerships, and they want the inventory and control plan of all land, water, minerals, plants, animals, construction, means of production, food, energy, information and data, and all human beings in the world. The ideology that they use for their plan is communitarianism, which means the individual's rights should be balanced against the rights of the community. This sounds great and all until you break it down. Community is constructed. It's constructed by non-governmental organizations, corporations, and governments in order to dictate and regulate what happens around the world. We as individuals have little to no influence on that unless we are in agreement with that. If you go against the community, communitarian law, or communitarian social tactics, you will be rejected and ostracized. They plan to create the harmonization of all systems under one central body and government. Basically all education, military, police force, government, economics, markets, entertainment, and news media are under the control of a small group of individuals who believe that they are superior to you and believe that they know how you should live your life more than you. In other words, a one world government. If you think all of this sounds crazy, just take a look at how much companies like BlackRock or Vanguard own. And also the fact that the CEO of BlackRock, Larry Fink, sits on the board of the World Economic Forum. A man who manages half of the amount of money, collectively, that the US has at $10 trillion. Working together, buddy-buddy, with the World Economic Forum. Or Bill Gates, who quietly became the largest private farmland owner while the pandemic was going on. Who committed $750 million in donations to the World Economic Forum. The reason corporations are joining is because they want to have a full movement of workers without borders or boundaries and to be able to move their goods without regulations and to reduce wages. This was a plan agreed to by 179 nations back in 1992 and it is a plan constructed by the United Nations. pandemic was the perfect crisis to implement the quote-unquote Great Reset. According to Klaus Schwab, quote, the pandemic represents a rare but narrow window of opportunity to reflect, reimagine, and reset our world to create a healthier, more equitable, and more prosperous future, end quote. He also claims, quote, we must act jointly and swiftly to revamp all aspects of our societies and economies from education to social contracts and working conditions, end quote. Interesting thing to note is that in May of 2018, the WEF partnered with John Hopkins to stimulate a fictitious pandemic dubbed Claudex to see how prepared the world would be if ever faced with such a crisis. A little over a year later, the WEF once again teamed up with John Hopkins along with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to stage another pandemic exercise called Event 201 in October of 2019. A few short months following the conclusion of Event 201, which specifically stimulated a coronavirus outbreak, the World Health Organization, WHO, officially declared that the coronavirus had reached a pandemic status on March 11th of 2020. In 2019, Event 201 stated on the website, quote, the next severe pandemic will not only cause great illness and loss of life, but could also trigger major cascading economic and societal consequences that could contribute greatly to global impact and suffering." End quote. Since then, just about every scenario covered in Claudex and Event 201 stimulations has come into play, including governments implementing lockdowns worldwide, the collapse of many industries, growing mistrust between government and its citizens, a greater adoption of biometric surveillance technologies, social media censorship in the name of combating misinformation, the desire to flood communication channels with quote, authoritative sources, and the breakdown of international supply chains, and many, many more. After the nightmare scenarios had fully materialized by mid-2020, 
the WEF founder declared, quote, now is the time for the Great Reset, in June of that same year. Was this just excellent forecasting, planning, and modeling on the part of the WEF and partners that Claude X and Event 201 turned out to be so prophetic? Or is there something more to it? Prior to the 2014 WEF meeting in Davos, Switzerland, Schwab announced that he hoped that the WEF would push the reset button on the global economy. Between 2014 and 2017, the WEF called to reshape, restart, reboot, and reset the global order every single year, each aimed at solving various crises. Then, in 2018, the Davos elites turned their heads towards simulating a fake pandemic scenarios to see how prepared the world would be in the face of a different crisis. On May 15th, 2018, John Hopkins Center for Health Security hosted the Claude X Pandemic Exercise in partnership with the WEF. The Claude X exercise included a mock video footage of actors giving scripted news reports about a fake pandemic scenario. The Claude X event also included discussion panels with real policymakers who assessed that governments and industry were not adequately prepared for the fictitious global pandemic. Quote, in the end, the outcome was tragic, the most catastrophic pandemic in history, with hundreds of millions of deaths, economic collapse, and societal upheaval. End quote. Then, on October 18th of 2019, in partnership with John Hopkins and the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, the WEF ran event 201. During the scenario, the entire global economy was shaken, and there were riots on the streets, and high-tech surveillance measures were needed to, quote, stop the spread. The John Hopkins Center for Health Security issued a public statement on January 24th of 2020 explicitly addressing that event 201 was not meant to predict the future. Quote, to be clear, the Center of Health Security and partners did not make a prediction of our tabletop exercise. For the scenario, we modeled a fictitious coronavirus pandemic, but we explicitly stated that it was not a prediction. Instead, the exercise served to highlight preparedness and response challenges that would likely arise in a very severe pandemic. End quote. Intentional or not, Event 201 highlighted the fictional challenges of a pandemic, along with the recommendations that go hand in hand with the Great Reset agenda that has set up camp and the nefarious new normal. Together, the John Hopkins Center for Health Security, the World Economic Forum, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation submitted several recommendations for governments, international organizations, and global businesses to follow in the event of a pandemic. The Event 201 recommendations call for a greater collaboration between the public and private sectors while emphasizing the importance of establishing partnerships with unelected global institutions such as the WHO, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and the International Air Transport Organization to carry out centralized response without any oversight. One of the recommendations calls for governments to partner with social media companies and news organizations to censor content and control the flow of information. According to the report, quote, governments will need to partner with traditional and social media companies to research, develop nimble approaches to countering misinformation. Also quote, national public health agencies should work in close collaboration with the World Health Organization to create the capability to rapidly develop and release consistent health messages. And quote, for their part, media companies should commit to ensuring that authoritative messages are prioritized and that false messages are suppressed through the use of technology. End quote. Any of this sound familiar? Throughout 2020, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube have been censoring, suppressing, and flagging any coronavirus-related information that goes against WHO recommendations as a matter of policy, just as Event 201 had recommended. Also, big tech companies have also deployed the same content suppression tactics during the 2020 U.S. presidential election, slapping, quote, disputed claims on content that question election integrity. Next on their agenda is a complete makeover of society under a technocratic regime of unelected bureaucrats who want to dictate how the world is run from the top down, leveraging invasive technologies to track and trace your every move while censoring and silence anyone who dares not comply. With 
major food shortages happening worldwide, the World Economic Forum has made sure to capitalize on this disaster. Like for example, again, Bill Gates, who has literally become America's largest farmland owner because he was able to swoop in and buy up multiple farmlands because they either went out of business due to mandate restrictions or dropped in value because again, mandate restrictions halted their business and production. The mandates were the perfect opportunity for Bill Gates to buy up all the land at a cheap price, along with the chaos of the pandemic overriding all of the news, helped him to stay in the shadows while he built his empire to dominate the food production industry. This is more worrying again because Bill Gates is tied to the World Economic Forum. The World Economic Forum has stirred up a lot of anger against the farmers from all over the world. Farmers are being forced to kill their livestock and close their farms in order to meet, quote, climate goals. The Dutch government passed a law allowing the government to take over the farmer's land. The Dutch minister who pushed the nitrogen law that grants the government the power to expropriate their farmer's land has a brother who owns the online supermarket called Picnic. Guess who invested $600 million into that company? None other than Bill Gates himself. The European Union and the World Economic Forum have instituted their Great Reset policies that will severely limit the nitrogen produced by farming between 30 and 70%. The only problem is LTO, which is a lobby group that represents 30,000 farmers, said that their nitrogen reduction level is, quote, simply unfeasible. The group says that the government is focused on reducing livestock and buying up farms and not paying enough attention to innovation and sustainable farming practices. So essentially what they're saying is that all farmers in the Netherlands are so incompetent that it is better for them to take their land because they know better what to do with it. This is literally insane. The Netherlands, which is one of the top beef exporters globally, are being forced to slaughter their cattle while there is a global food shortage happening right now and has been happening. Their brilliant plan is to kill off perfectly good livestock and the world's fifth biggest meat exporter because somehow that livestock emits gas that will kill our Earth's natural habitats. What makes this even more honestly at this point laughable is that they also decided to do that while the war with Russia and Ukraine is going on. Russia is the world's number one wheat exporter, while Ukraine is the world's fifth biggest wheat exporter. Since they are locked together in an all-out war, production on wheat has taken a major hit globally. What's interesting to note about the World Economic Forum and how other governments are handling agriculture today is very similar to how the Chinese farmers have been treated for the past 100 years. History has proven that whenever farmers are interfered with, disaster will come. To give an example, China changed the farming system and forced farmers into mass collectives during the Great Leap Forward from 1958 to 1962. It caused a disaster, killing tens of millions of people via starvation. Or when the Soviet Union forced farmers to do collectivization of agriculture as part of its five-year plan, about 5.7 to 8.7 million people are estimated to have lost their lives. What's happening right now in the Netherlands, and also in Canada, is quite similar and very scary, because these countries are implementing the World Economic Forum's agenda. But the disaster in Sri Lanka offered a preview of what will happen to the countries who continue to follow this agenda. As far as the World Economic Forum is concerned, you can't have a great reset if you don't reset the food supply, because food is necessary for everyone's survival. In the Soviet Union, Stalin recognized this. Whoever controls the food, controls the people. The same goes with energy. That's why even right now, while food shortages are happening worldwide, instead of easing restrictions and encouraging more production, the Dutch government and Canadian government are clamping down even harder. Luckily, the Dutch farmers are not going to back down. They are rising up stronger and stronger. At the same time, Canadian farmers are protesting against the government because the Trudeau Liberals say that they are aiming at a 30% reduction in emissions, not fertilizer. But farming advocates say that reducing nitrogen oxide emissions cannot be done at this point without reducing fertilizer use anyways. Why are they pushing this agenda in times of food shortages worldwide? Do they really want to save our planet? It doesn't seem like it. What it seems like is that they want to increase control over people. It seems like the goal is to centralize power at the national and even international level. And this is exactly the communist ideology. It's easy to understand that because the executive chairman of the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, has a very close relationship with the Chinese Communist Party. We are 
just in the midst of a transformation process where we move in the world from a unipolar to a multipolar world. And of course, here China, in this new geopolitical and geoeconomic context, plays an enormous role. It wasn't until early February when I was in a meeting that experts at the foundation said, there's no way, you know, this, there's been too much uh, travel without diagnosis uh, for us to contain this. And then at that point, we didn't really understand the fatality rate. You know, we didn't understand that it's a fairly low fatality rate and that it's a disease mainly of the elderly, kind of like flu is, although a bit different than that kind of like fluids, although a bit different than that. It seems like China and the World Economic Forum are making moves together to usurp America's dominance on the world stage. What do you think? Another way the World Economic Forum is capitalizing on more power is through its green agenda. They despise natural gas, coal, and nuclear energy, but see solar, wind, and hydro as sustainable renewable energy sources that can power our entire global grid. Michael Schellenberger, a lifelong environmentalist who is also on the Time Magazine Hero of Environment and President of Environmental Progress, which is a research and policy organization. He states that solar and wind farms are not the answer to renewable energy for the future. Back before the Obama administration, he organized a coalition of the country's biggest labor unions and biggest environmentalist groups. They together made a proposal for a $300 billion investment in renewables. Their idea was not only to prevent climate change, but to create millions of jobs in a very fast growing sector. In 2007, Obama's administration had embraced their vision and between 2009 to 2015, the U.S. invested $150 billion in renewables and other kinds of clean tech. But right away, they started to encounter some problems. First of all, the electricity from solar rooftops ends up costing twice as much as the electricity from solar farms. And both solar and wind farms require covering a pretty significant amount of land with solar panels and wind turbines, and also building very big transmission lines to bring all that electricity from the countryside into the city. Both of those things were often very strongly resisted by local communities as well as conservation biologists who were concerned about the impacts on wild bird species and other animals. One of the biggest problems with solar and wind energy is their intermittency. They only generate electricity about 10 to 30 percent of the time during the year. Another thing is no amount of technological information can solve the two biggest problems on both solar panels and wind turbines. The sun not shining for half the day and wind not blowing reliably. Interesting thing to know is that in California, during the period where solar panels have come down in price very significantly, same with wind, they've seen their electricity prices go up five times more than the rest of the country. The same phenomenon is happening in Germany, which is one of the world's leader in solar, wind, and other renewable technologies. Their prices increased 50% during the big renewable energy push. Now, you might think, well, it's because of climate change. If paying more for energy means saving our planet, then that makes it worth it, right? Well, it would be until you look at France. France actually gets twice as much of its electricity from zero clean emission sources than Germany does, and yet France pays almost half as much for its electricity. How can that be? 
Well, it's because France gets most of its electricity from nuclear power, about 75% in total. And nuclear ends up being more reliable with generating power 24 hours a day, seven days a week for about 90% of the year. Also, you need up to 450 times more land for solar than nuclear to power the same amount of electricity. So are they really saving the earth by genuinely searching for the best renewable resources? Or are they just using another crisis to profit off of higher energy prices caused by their supposed saving earth policies? Now, there's so much more information to go over on the World Economic Forum, but unfortunately I can only go over so much on one video. All in all, they are a rule-based international order, which is antithetical to American liberty and independence. It undermines the power of self-determination of ordinary Americans and empowers the technocratic assembly of self-identified experts. It disregards the democratic interest of Americans generally and imposes the will of the 1% upon everyone else. It sacrifices American law for international agreements. It substitutes government approved speech for free speech. It destroys privacy while justifying mass surveillance. It transfers American control over their own personal wealth to the money printing central banks. It elevates the power of global governing bodies over statutory authority of local jurisdictions. It fortifies the intrusive reach of an unelected bureaucracy while weakening protections for individual rights. And all in all, it resurrects, in other words, a feudal system where a small number of lords and ladies pour power over a borderless economic zone whose surviving serfs are expected to own nothing and be happy.